I'm DJ. And I'm Andrew. Welcome to One Shot Savern. A TTRPG podcast where we seek out new ways to tell your stories through different systems and games. Today, what are we talking We're about talking today? About it. We're, what are we doing? We are talking about Dungeons and Dragons. Not just 5th edition, but 1, 6, 5 point yeah, five. Whatever edition and 3.5 because we're going to talk about our experiences and the things that we've loved the things that we have not loved and the things that we wish we could change and that's why we're trying other systems we're just going to talk about it all first question how would you describe the state of the actual system dungeons and dragons fifth edition and where it's going and then second question is more about public sentiment and and where we live okay easy question uh, the current state is a mess brought to you by the people who have to ban magic cards before the magic cards come out. Right. Um, and when you look at it that way, it, it, you kind of start to kind of see the cracks in the foundation. It's a fairly good foundation. Fifth edition was easy for people to pick up. Um, It corrected some things from 3.5. It carried over some things from 4th edition uh, and kind of like, you know, eased them back a little bit for, you know, public consumption after the outlast. They snuck them in. They snuck them in, exactly. And uh, where it's at right now is it's kind of a mess. Uh, I run mostly Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition as a game master for hire uh, six, seven games a week. Um, it it's a mess, and I'm starting to realize more and more because my players are clever. My my players are smart. They're working together for my demise. Uh, and as such, uh, I'm starting to realize like, oh, I have a party where everybody, where everybody has silvery barbs. No, and they're all different classes. That's a nightmare. Yeah. Um. So that that's where it's at right now. Uh, as fifth edition. Uh, It's still fun to play. It's still a good entry point, I think, for people because it's crunchy enough that, like, you can learn other rules rather easily if you can master Dungeons and Dragons. Um, And I think it's a good palate cleanser. It's something that is nice to go back to, play a quick, like, you know, whether it's a short campaign or a one shot or, you know, you're just getting together for five sessions. It is a good palate cleanser. And I've been pulling and talking to the community about this. And, you know, yes, that's why I've been asking these questions, everyone, um, is because I want to get your feelings on it. Uh, second question was, uh, what was the second question? Well, okay, so let me throw my two cents in on where I, yeah, some absolutely. of the other state of the game stuff. I did ask you the question, so thank you for answering. But I think that just to add a couple things, this is my very outsider take on stuff, right? Like, I'm not, I don't work at Wizards of the Coast on the Dungeons yeah. and Dragons team. I don't know why they make the decisions they do. I do know they've made a lot of bad ones, Um, but that's because I'm on the receiving end. Also, I'm seeing the way that it affects the community. So we'll get to the community sentiment, which is kind of question two in a second, but the the actual game has lived, fifth edition has lived longer than any other edition they've done so far. Over 10 years now. They did OG... Um, D and D was then. Repl- I don't know the exact timelines and years and stuff, but like it was fairly quickly changed from Chainmail to Dungeons and Dragons. Then it was changed to Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, and all the different editions that have come since have been fairly quick. It's a couple of years basically between. Yeah. Um, the longest one before Fifth Edition was three, which then 0.5. grew oh, so much 5. and needed to be errated and changed, and people liked it so much that they made 3.5, which was just an evolution of the same system, just tweaked, adjusted, made bigger, more options, tons of third-party publishing content. This is what created much of what we benefit from now, which is a diverse community of independent publishers. So that happened in 3.5. And they re-released their handbooks, and they did a second edition of their third edition book, which was why people called it 3.5. Um... Then they made fourth. They did their own thing. They 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 differed and genuinely made a new game. Um, it is a different game. Fourth edition, I wish could be reset, remarketed, and and sold as a different game. If it was never called yeah. fourth edition, it would have found its audience in I think yeah. a more successful way. 
And I genuinely commend Wizards of the Coast for trying to do a new system. They did a good job to make a different system. They did not make their audience happy, and that's why it failed effectively. Then you come back to 5th edition, their ethos completely shifts back to, let's make 3.5 but not completely broken. Like, they, they literally 180'd from where they were with 4th edition. They're like, we learned stuff from 4th edition, but people really just want 3.5 but yeah. clean and streamlined. And so they, they did what's more like a heavy, heavy-handed edit. Um, they went, what did we what did we do right with 3.5 and how do we make it work better? And they started over and there are things that are very different. But at the end of the day, if you've played 3.5, 5e will take you maybe an hour or two to get up to speed on. Seriously. Like, it's so easy to make that shift. It's the same damn system. Um, it's It's just tweaked. And now... If you really extend that timeline, right? So however long 3 to 3.5 was out, that I think is is probably like, I think it was like seven-ish years. And then they did fourth edition. But you add that, which is effectively the same system as fifth edition. This game now has a life closer to like 17 years. Um, yeah. And they're just continuing to iterate on it. That switches and, over yeah. to the public sentiment and the the journey that people have gone on with a system that they've found familiar. Um, this new book that's coming out, you know, there's Three plenty. New books. Yeah, sorry. This new version that's coming out publicly has been called a million things. It was when it was in beta, they were very much leaning a little bit more towards actually of probably making a sixth, sixth edition that was going to shift a lot. People didn't like yeah. it. That was called one D and D. That officially has closed. That project closed. They did a whole public statement saying we're not doing one D&D. We're just going to continue supporting 5th edition and yeah. making it better. But they're basically doing the same thing all over again with 5.5, making it 5.5. And it is 5.5, but it, here's the thing. I would, looking at it and like looking at the rules that I've seen from it, Yes, it is very close to 5th edition. And 5.5 .5 is probably the most apt description of what we've got here. Yeah. But it almost feels like a 5.75. Sure. Because of some of the major changes they've made. For example, your Tasha's your fantasy race no longer... Yeah, Tasha's. But like your fantasy race no longer uh, determines your ASI, uh, yeah. you know, like the stat boost that you get in the beginning. Instead makes sense to move it over to backgrounds and yeah. i know some people are gonna be like i hate that but andrew and i play cypher system and for us it, we're already kind of on that track anyway yeah. so um yeah when it comes to fifth edition it's it's obviously it's gone through tons and tons of books the, i don't even know how many books are out but i know that i stopped buying them a couple of years ago and I already had probably 20 books. I, I don't know if that's the right number, but I have a ton of 5th edition books. Um, they have put out tons of books. And all along the way, which they are want to do, um, they've made su sufficient, essentially patch notes throughout about, not notes, but updates to mechanics that were not well designed over a decade ago. And, you know, you've got your classic problems. Again, hey, if you're if you're um, totally versed on all of this 5th edition stuff, like, you can skip ahead. I'm just catching people up. Um, but basically, uh, you know, you've got problems like the Ranger. You've got problems like um, some concentration stuff. You have different issues with just little spells being completely broken or terrible. And, you know, the updates have been made along the way. Then you have books like Tasha's and Morden Kane's. And those those were, if we were to make our own timeline, those really feel like 5.5 .5 for me. Because at that point, yes, they redid the Ranger. They, the, right? Was that the book that did yep. redid the Ranger? Was it Morden Kane's or Tasha's? It was. It wasn't Tasha's. It was it wasn't Tasha's. I think it was Morden Cannon's, and it was when they started to make the Ranger a little bit more um, useful. Functional. I've always liked the Ranger. More functional, right? Yeah. Uh, more utility, right? It's no longer uh, powered by the the uh, by fantasy racism. 
you know? Uh, uh, exactly. Which is oh, basically a favorite to like foe. elves? Right, yeah. Calm down there, bud. Which mechanically wasn't fun because you'd be like, I don't have yeah. access to most of my features unless I'm fighting a specific enemy. Yep. That's no fun. Um, Honestly, but yeah, that, yeah, it doesn't make sense. That brings me to one of my favorite things that I have heard about with uh, the 2024 Player's Handbook and all of that stuff. And it is, once again, uh, making the ranger better, changing how the ranger works. So now your favored foe is linked directly to Hunter's Mark. Okay. And so uh, when you have something Hunter's Marked, it is your favorite foe. Wasn't that and how it was? Move that. No. No, I mean uh, in, still, in the yeah. in the second version of the Ranger. Wasn't that how that was? No, no. They've changed it even further. Oh, so man. with the okay. second version, it, you still had to like use um, you know, your favorite foe action. You'd have to declare it, all that stuff. With this, it is just yeah, fully linked. So yeah. this is now a a boon of Hunter's March sure. for the Ranger. Um, so like there are some things that I, I, I do like, but yeah. with the state of the public sentiment, as yep. we were talking, um, it's funny because, you know, we we're in a community, uh, that is different than some TTRPG community. I would more right? thoroughly define us as in the TTRPG community, not necessarily the Dungeons and Dragons community. Right, there's entire Absolutely. channels that their whole brand is tied to D&D. There's so many that they're intrinsically linked. We built ours on documenting our journey of leaving 5th edition. In the community that we're in, which is in itself di different from other communities, right? Like, we look at our community, and it's quite large with the titter pigs and the beggar talks and all of that stuff. Um, so it's, it's sometimes hard to gauge public sentiment. Yeah. Uh, because like we have our friends like GM Duality, uh, who is very much like if you're not gonna make a meaningful change to your system, don't, don't do it and wait until. And I understand that sentiment, but also at the same time, like I understand, right? You know the incremental change, right? Yeah. Uh, I, fifth edition was incredibly popular and such a huge success uh, that of course Wizards of the Coast is terrified of botching it, you know touching it and then it becoming oh this is sixth edition and we have another fourth edition which yeah. will happen it happens every single time yep uh and then on the other hand you know we've got uh some other you know friends of ours who you know very much still like dungeons and dragons they just buy third party books yep. you know because all of the rules that are going to be changed those are all public yep. right uh it's it's free stuff um not the books but like the actual rule changes are free stuff. So right. like you've got Justin with So You Want to Be a DM. You know, they were like, hey, I uh, don't buy Wizards of the Coast stuff anymore because there's so many third party things yep. for me to, to do. We are going to see that level of support most likely come with this new edition. And therefore, if you don't want to buy the books you really don't have to um now and... within our space there's really there's re very polar takes to, to dj's point right like we have friends that'll say i'll never touch the thing right they have problems with wizards yep. of the coast rightfully so their business practices and and things that they've done with the game in the themes of the game and the mechanics of the game all those things are legitimate critiques of this game we are primarily talking about this because we played 5th edition, the original version yeah. of it, for a long time, and it is very special to us for what it was for us in our Absolutely. life, not because we endorse or agree with things that have been done by the publishers. And so right. we, I don't really play D&D anymore, right? The short version for me is I don't. I don't have a plan to purchase anything else from Watsi ever again. I might pick up a game that uses the base of a, of a D20 5e-like system again, but I don't have any plans to, and nothing really excites me in that space right now. That's not to say I wouldn't play in a game if it was going, right. but I don't want to give that company money right now. And then moreover, I'm uninterested by the mechanics that they're even trying to adjust to make better, right? Like, I, I find more creative fulfillment as a gamer and as a as a as a game master playing other games like that's where i land right 
DJ, you run it for I'm a running. living in a yeah. lot of ways. And as hard as that is to get away from, it's not because you feel trapped by it. You like running the game. And that is valid. You know, it's like there's a lot of people that they just like playing this game. That's okay. You can play this game and, and figure out where you are at on your moral journey of supporting corporations. You know, that is, yeah. that's up to you. There are plenty of ways to play this game without financially backing um, Absolutely. one of those. Now, back on, you know, I run it for a living. You know, it's so annoying um, because, like, I have been looking at other options for running games. Um, there are options. Uh, Dagger Heart, I would like to be out by the time that I am actually running. Um, right. It's not out yet. It's still in revision. Uh, things are going to change. I'm going to pick up bad habits. Yep. Uh, I don't want to, I don't want to, I like, if I'm going to run it, I want to run it well. Yeah. Uh, Pathfinder on the other hand is something that I could easily jump in and not have to change anything that I'm doing yeah. as a game master. Right. For because like part. everything for the most part, like there's, there's some, you know, more esoteric, like rule stuff. I have to understand, yeah. uh, the insanity that is the character creation. Uh, so that like, I, you know, my players aren't, uh, Confused. I can correct them. Right. Uh, but when it comes back to it, um, most of my customers are Dungeons and Dragons players. And it, it really kind of makes me look at this from a different point of view. I have my own frustrations with Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro and just Dungeons and Dragons as a brand um, that while I have customers who are very like-minded to me, um, they're not worried about that. Right. Uh, they're, like, they are, but, like, they still want to play and pay for Dungeons and Dragons. Um, so that kind of requires me to in order to you know keep making money uh to, to stay up to date and current yeah. on dungeons and dragons products um it's frustrating it is frustrating because like i would love i would love because i love these people i love my customers right that that's uh like i am very personally connected to these people uh and i want to keep playing games with them yeah um, and so it's one of those things where I'm like, oh man, uh, if, what if I do, you know, do this and I, I feel like I could get them into Pathfinder pretty easily, yep. but a lot of them are very similar to me in which they need the tools to help them fully understand it. Those tools are things like D and D beyond, right? And so yep. Demi plane has that for Pathfinder second edition. I, and I'm looking at the price and I was just like, who oh boy. Yeah. Uh, if I want to get everything from Pathfinder and D&D Beyond, it's going to be $2,300, with a, and that's that's with the 25% discount. And here's the thing. I've done it before, right? I have everything on D&D Beyond. Up to date? To be fair, I am up to date. Somebody, one oh, of my customers yeah. bought me the player's handbooks. Oh, boy. Yeah. So, I mean, you already got it. It's like, I think... No, so I already have it. Um, yeah. I think that what's what's tricky about tying it to your business right like like even mm -hmm. to use the the behemoth version it's like with critical world you look at them making efforts to distance themselves from wizards of the coast both as their own corporate entity interested in their yep. own profits to not be pushing someone somewhere else yep. right like it'd be like i made a brand all about how much i like drinking coca-cola right i am inevitably promoting a different mega corporation that is going to profit from yeah. me talking about it. So it's like as yeah, a yeah. corporation and a capitalist venture, Critical Role is seeking to maximize their profits and keep things in house. So they've made Dagger Heart, they've made Candela Obscure, and they've promoted these products. And that doesn't make them fundamentally bad games or anything like that. They're they are good games. I have played. Yeah, they're super cool. Uh, I haven't I haven't played Dagger Heart yet, but like I've read through it. Um and they are doing a lot to make their own thing, carve out their own space to it can control the customer journey. I'm going full marketing mode here. You don't want to, in marketing, send your customer 
like yeah. off site, right? It's why TikTok su suppresses stuff. It's why YouTube suppresses stuff. They don't want you talking about other platforms. They don't want you sending someone somewhere else where they could lose the customer on this journey where they might get a sale, they might run an ad, whatever. Same thing for any other capitalist venture. They don't want you using third-party publishers. D&D &D doesn't. You know, they don't really want you to cite the OGL debacle, right? Like that whole thing. If you're not familiar with it, there are entire hour-long videos on the internet all about it. OGL 2023 or whatever. That is, that was a whole thing where they were clapping down on their licensing and how people could use their game. And it was retroactive and problematic. And it was a capitalist ideal that they were trying to hold on to their customer and get all of the money just for themselves. All that to say, play indie games. Um, but also, there these games are huge, and 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 any of these entities in, is interested in in creating something for their community that allows them to control that journey. People out there believe. I think incorrectly, without being a hot take here, incorrectly that because they've learned D&D, &D, that was a lot of work and it was difficult. And it is because it has yeah. products like D&D &D Beyond and because it has a lot of integration with different VTTs and stuff, they have already learned the most accessible game. That's I think that's how a lot of people feel because oh, yeah. the players are there. Think of like video games, right? It's like, oh, well, people are playing this game. So it's a multiplayer game and I will be able to queue into a lobby with players, right? Yeah. If I play an indie game, I have to, uh, the, it might take forever to load in, right? Like is kind of how you can think of it. It's, it is, yeah. some of the is true, yep. but it is not the most accessible game. And accessibility no, is no. a huge priority for tons and tons of third-party publishers yeah. and independent games. I would say that the uh, accessibility as a term means so many different things. Dungeons and Dragons is by far not the easiest TTRPG to learn. Granted, it is everywhere, yep. right? And so it is accessible to access. As you mentioned, queuing into a party, it's right. Uh, games on uh, Start Playing Games with where They're everywhere. With my, you know, um, if I post a vampire the masquerade game i'm probably going to get it filled in a few weeks mm -hmm. right not bad uh if i post a cypher game i will never fill it um right. i will i will get players for it well and, and, we'll and on the customer side right like if i want to go find a game yeah. yep. i can find a game tonight for D, &D no problem yeah, yeah even no. 3.5 like i can probably find a game to play tonight you know there's going to now that's accessible in terms of getting into a table. There's another level of accessibility that's more in relation to disability and more into being able to learn the system. People, I think, mainly in, so they, I think it is accessible in terms of market saturation. It is not accessible for a lot of people when it comes to rule density, simplicity, consistency, like all of the things that would make this system easy to learn are all over the place, right? Like there are things that are very simple and unified rules within oh, the absolutely. system that make sense. And you're like, good, I got yeah. the whole thing down. But having played a lot of other systems now, holy cow, there's so many mechanics that are disunified and inconsistent in fifth edition compared to other systems. Like Especially Pathfinder now. as an example is the closest, yeah. I would say one-to-one -one where it is genuinely a different system, but you could learn how to start playing it at least in a couple hours and learn the differences. And it's like, and in for those of you who are thinking, you know, DC 20 is closer. Yeah. DC 20 is Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. It is basically, they took the rules and transposed them. Pathfinder is its own he's thing. He's doing a killer does job. differently. Right? Well, absolutely. Like he's, yeah, it's yeah. an incredible game that he's building. Yeah. And it is slowly moving i think across the like i've been following the project for a long time dc20 just had a huge kickstarter they made i think like two million dollars i don't know it if it's done um it's because it's a good idea he's taking what people like about fifth edition and he's trying to make a whole new game that is inspired by it but going in its own direction and not bound by the 5e label or system yeah and which is how we got pathfinder first edition exactly and that's how 
a lot of these new games that are popping up post OGL debacle, you know, it's like a lot of them are saying there's a space to not play fifth edition and we want to fill that and we want to be available for people. Yes. On Absolutely. the business side, the, the negative view of that is, oh, everybody's just trying to capitalize on this huge audience that D and D is, has found and somewhat lost. And then on the other end of it, it's like, no, they're genuinely trying to provide a service. So you figure out how you land morally when it comes to any big corporation building out a game to take advantage of your wallet. That's up to you. But all that is saying we do love fifth edition as a game. There's a lot we don't like about it. So let's talk about what we didn't enjoy mechanically um, or, or left us feeling a lack, you know, in fifth edition if they're doing anything to address it in this 5.5 version of the of the books and if we know of other systems that handle those things better that we have enjoyed playing in other systems so dj if that is too many questions i can narrow it down but what about fifth edition didn't do it for you are they addressing it in 5.5 and does another system do it better go that's uh hard question i don't know everything about the newest new system yeah. i do know that um spells often that there are so many bunk awful waste of an action spells in yeah. dungeons true and strike. dragons fifth edition true strike has Which been bolt? reworked to be more of a reaction yeah um right uh I, hey don't don't shit on witch bolt no i, I like love it witch bolt it's uh, just not very good no, absolutely, right? And some and that's that's the, right. There's a a um not uniformity, yeah, when it comes to cantrips that there there should be, right? Um cantrips should not be as confusing as they are. Eldritch Blast and, you know, Firebolt can't be the only two cantrips yeah. that people use constantly because they're not great uh on their on their own and like they're still good they're better than most cantrips but at the same time it's like man well you know firebolt i'm a wizard who has 30 yeah. spells firebolt um and that happens a lot it's funny because um they did make some changes to these spells right they've they've um made things a little bit better for some of these cantrips uh some of these um some of these actual spell spells too. Uh, in fact, I was reading an interview where I think it was Chris Perkins. Um, specific was it Chris Perkins or was it Jeremy Crawford? It was it was one, one of them. Of, one their of them. team, senior uh, team. They they're the same person, really. Uh, Have you ever seen them uh, together? Yes, but it could have been mirrors. Uh, anyways, uh, they were talking about how. Uh, they were playing Baldur's Gate 3, and for the yeah. first time in 10 years, they realized how crappy a spell was. Produce Flame. It was Produce Flame, and they're yep. like, wait, I have to use an action, and then I have to wait through, tw you know, 15 other people to get done with their combat, and hopefully what I was trying to set up is going to work, and, oh, okay, crap maybe we need to redo that so like just funny because like they put out a five minute video where they talked all about this and then they did not mention at all how they're fixing none it. of it none of it um it's so frustrating but like it's it's funny because like you know this new book has tons of spells so yeah. many spells over hun hundreds of spells it was like 200 or something um here's the reason why i think they didn't talk about it it's because they didn't really add spells they just reworked them which is good because a lot of them need reworked and there are so many spells that never get used because, well, it doesn't really benefit the combat. Um, so, yeah, there are things that could change. Uh, there are things that I liked that they're changing that I don't like. Um, for example, the Paladin. Um, Smite. I love Divine Smite. Uh... If I like, I Paladin is one of my favorite classes to play. Um, and Same. it's a spell now. Divine Smite is is a reaction spell. So it is an actual spell. Spell, right? No, it, it is a spell. You had different spell smites. 
and then you had a class feature right. that was divine smite. So you could and stack only them you and you could and use stuff. that. Yeah. Only the paladin could use that. Yep. That is no longer the case. Yep. They have changed why why you become and play as a paladin. They've buffed those aspects of it. But now Divine Smite is just kind of relegated to the rest of the smites. And I think they're starting to rework like Wrathful Smite and uh, Burning, all of that, right? Searing Smite. Um, I think they're reworking those to You know what also... I just realized? Huh. Smite, this is what I wish they had done with it. Smite, in, in a way, was very much tied to the identity of the class. Agreed? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. That's yeah. why you play it. Similarly, Eldritch Blast is very much tied to the identity of playing a Warlock because of how they've Absolutely. built this game and it being very optimal to choose that. What they did well with the original design of Eldritch Blast is they tied a bunch of class feature advancements uh, that are called uh, Eldritch Invocations yep. to changing how your Eldritch Blast works. They didn't do that with Smite, and they totally should have. They should have. That's Absolutely. what I'm saying. So Wrathful Smite shouldn't have been a thing. Wrathful should have been like an advancement or an evocation that then Same tied for to your I class. Agree. Yeah, one hundred percent with you on that. Um, it, it really should have. Uh, instead, they've made some you know changes that I haven't gotten too deep into the woods with yeah. with the uh, Paladin. Yeah. But everyone who's playtested it that I've talked to is like, oh, yeah, this works really good. I just wish, you know, they hadn't uh, yeah. given smite to everybody who could cast that type of spell. Um, I'm assuming it's just, like, the... relegated to, like, divine evocation casters. So, like, probably, I like, think. cleric, maybe, like, a solar, not solar, probably like a... Probably a warlock. Yeah, a warlock, like a celestial warlock and, like, a, whatever the sorcerer yeah. is that's the div divine soul sorcerer or something. Divine soul, yeah. Yeah. Um... On the on the flip side, we have the the anti paladin, which is your warlock, right? But they changed eldritch invocations. Okay, um, you get more of them more often. So instead of you just getting like the five eldritch invocations, yeah. you're gonna get them staggered more often as you level up. Okay, and they've added to the list of eldritch invocations. Uh, in order to kind of like really, uh, how does that not fix... just blow the lid on power creep? Like, how does that? Obviously, do more... are there more of them and they them. suck more? Like, well, I mean, look at look at the elder identifications that we had in fifth edition. Sure, they they've changed it so that uh, it's you can get more of these things. You're not locked out of them. And yeah. so they've adjusted them. Because, like, a lot of them were pretty, not inconsequential. Double Sight is not inconsequential. It's great. Ask uh, Jane and Perry. people wish they could take it more often, but they always take the same three Eldritch invocations, and it is Agonizing Blast. It is, um, oh, shoot, what's the one that? Uh, repelling Blast. And then there is Eldritch Spear, which allows you to attack using Eldritch Blast from 300 feet away. Those are the ones people take. Yep. And then they're like, oh, I might take Devil's Sight and, and I then might take Eyes of the Keeper, and, and then, then you're done. yeah. So yeah. I, I mean, also, yeah, yeah. So this this brings up what I would say is my answer to what is broken, is it being fixed, and does another system do it better? I would say the most, and this this goes genre wide. So this is not specific to D and D five E, I would say, but it is a huge problem I have with five E. And surprise, surprise, all of our TikTok friends will agree. System mastery is interesting. I do think it is broken in a lot of ways. What is system mastery? System mastery is you need to have a good idea of how the entire system works, all the available abilities and all this stuff yeah. to do what is considered at a lot of tables optimal play. Um, yeah. Let me say that a different way. It is possible to play 5e and make a character that you think is going to be fun that actually sucks and yeah. you fall behind your play your your other players in damage you fall behind uh in feeling effective like it's not just about numbers this is not just about oh you don't have the most optimal damage output this is down to actually having fun you can build a character that you think is going to be fun to play and you get to the table and you feel stifled or like you did it wrong or somebody else did it better and why am i not having as much fun as them you know like they're because the flip side of that coin for this new person is 
somebody who has mastered the system, they research videos, they watch videos to learn about optimal builds. And okay, but here's the thing. That is super fun. That is it a is. style it really of play. is. No, I I I pick on min maxers. Yeah. I support them because right. it is it's fun. It it is a way to go, okay, how can I maximize my uh damage output? Right. The problem is fifth edition does not give me as the game master a good way to kind of counteract that. Yeah. It's and that's so, frustrating. So let's let's talk about that generally, right? So I play a game called Destiny 2. And similarly, in Destiny 2, there's tons of ways to build craft. They're constantly adjusting the meta to the game of they're buffing and nerfing different items in the game to make it yeah. a viable, new, fun play experience. Those things need to happen. It's a video game, and that can happen way quicker without charging anybody anything. So that's a benefit to a video game. Uh, but in the TTRBG space, similarly, you that that is how a lot of people approach 5e and why they don't switch to a lot of other indie games because they see cool ways to build. And if I build this really well, I can do something really cool. I, I'm in support of that. The problem is that's not how everybody plays. And you can definitely play at a table full of people like that and have a blast. Conversely, that can't exist without the ability to make a bad character, right? So, yeah. like, I'm not saying the game sucks because you can make a bad character. I'm saying there's a diversity of people that can play, and it makes it harder to have an even playing field um, of fun, not just of damage output or anything yeah. like that. And um, I don't think they're addressing that problem. I think no. that they no. are recognizing that and they're like, whatever, we don't care. We're going to keep building this game as is, which is why a lot of people continue to play it and why a lot of people will walk away from it. Um, yeah, that is a, definitely a problem. I definitely think other systems do a better job of handling that. Um, now, I think that's a similar problem with Cypher. Let me be very clear, right? But again, that's risk reward. So if, if system, I would say, if I were to make a quote, if system mastery is a dynamic in the system you're playing, you have to handle that and how you will experience fun. And you need to address that with your players. If yeah. they are not there for that and they're just purely there for like a more narrative experience, that needs to be dealt with. And if somebody's like, I really just want to make cool builds and do damage, you, they should probably be playing different systems. Um, you know, your critical roles of the world are people who, and, and I know Brennan Lee Mulligan's going to disagree on this one, you know, because he definitely listens, but right. he is a huge fan and thinks that 5e facilitates a lot of narrative play. I think that they're doing narrative play in spite of the system not supported by it. They're playing a battle sim yeah. at the same time as they are expert actors that are doing role play at a table. And it's in spite of the system. It's not because of the yeah. system. It's a pretty simple fix to add that to, right? You just give more uh, guidance as to yeah. how to, um, you know, get through non-combat conflict, right? Yep. Because all it is, it is conflict and, you know, abilities, character abilities, or, you know, features, yeah. or traits, right? Whatever. Those are are what you should be using, and spells, right? What you should be using in order to get through that, right? They need to um, add a reward, yeah. in my opinion, to fifth, or to Dungeons & Dragons in order to... Because, like, my players are so good. So good at the the narrative side of Dungeons & Dragons. Even though, like you said, it is largely geared towards fighting. Most yep. spells are geared towards fighting uh, and providing advantage for fighting. Um, but, like, you look at it and there... It's the slightest foundation for having a more narrative play with the occasional spell the occasional yeah. special you know special ability or sorry that's cypher feature Whatever. and it's just it's just not enough um whereas with cypher you could build an entire character who isn't going to fight um like their entire 
thing is they are going to use their abilities to get out of things without fighting. Yeah. Uh, and it's very good for that. Um, some systems are going to be more narrative heavy. Um, and it's really just a different style of play for your yeah. players. Some are like very much, I am here, here to chat. Yep. And others are very much, I'm here to hit things with my hammer. I think that if I could weed the community, put people into places that I think they should be, and who should play Dungeons and Dragons and who shouldn't, you know, like whatever, not that I'm going to do that, but, but practically if I was giving somebody advice and they were like, I want to get into TRPGs. Cool. If I were guiding them towards 5e and subsequent editions that were coming down the pike, one, I'd say buy independent. But aside from that, yeah. um, play this game if you want to build craft. If that is a part of the game that you want to be there. This game is about finding things that you can exploit within the game to do something cool, to do something big, to yeah. do big number. Like that's that's the game you're playing. If that's not a high priority, like a high priority, there are better games to facilitate potentially the kind of play that you want to do. And 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 it's not to say you shouldn't play 5e for that. It's to say, I think that that needs to be considered because when you're trying to, when we sit down at a table, we choose a rule set based on what people can get into easily and what facilitates the type of play that we're participating in. Yeah. If you're running, a, so the, that, that comes back to why play 5e. If you're running, this, there's so many independent products out there that I'm like, could you have just maybe made this not 5e and made a better game? Because they're like, I want to do Stardew Valley 5e. Don't do that. Like, you're throwing away 70% of the rule set and just using a d20 and some of the familiar mechanics just because you feel safe there. And I get that. But there, there are going to be entire systems that are robust to do exactly the goals that you might have for the game that you're trying to do. Same thing with survival. You know, like, I loved playing Mothership. Like, survival horror yeah. doesn't work well in 5e because your players will always feel powerful and yeah. they will be able to do some level of breaking the game to where they don't feel threatened. You can make a very gritty game, but at the end of the day, your player is going to, because of how the game encourages them to think, they're going to believe that they can win. And that doesn't fit to every genre. And so that's no, where you look at a system that in its core rule set, it's like, this is about, like, what is it? Basically, the idea was like, you get one of the three. You don't get to yeah. solve the secret and survive. You you either solve it or you get away. But you might oh, be that, left that... wanting. It was solve, uh, survive, and it was an, I think it was another S. But, like, the idea is, like, it, it helps set the tone with how the game runs um and similarly like 5e is a it's a combat heavy game that uses a lot of build crafting to have a lot of fun it, it is and um here's the thing i so i i don't min max my characters um i do tweak them a little bit uh, if i play different variations of them one of my fun ones recently has been like i am a uh, a guy who throws things in uh, a short campaign that i'm doing uh, first, I played this character with Justin from So You Want to Be a DM uh, and wasn't quite there and I was kind of useless because I hadn't quite figured it out. And now I am playing this in a False Hydra um, like five shot and it is I'm the only character who is useful um, after I've adjusted and like made things better. Because, uh, oh, what direction did, uh, you know, is the corner of my eye, like, yeah, throw my weapon, which my, uh, you know, my um, archetype for my fighter is thrown weapons fighting. Yeah. I have a feature that is for throwing weapons, and so they come back. Uh, and so, like, I'm just throwing the weapon, rolling at disadvantage. Captain it's in that direction. Right. And so it's yeah. uh, all of a sudden becomes very useful. Um, so some characters are very situational, um, yeah. but I did have to still kind of like tweak and adjust and like learn 
that character better. Um, like I, but like I said, I don't typically do that. I'm yeah. not typically the the min max character type. Uh, I like to do things for narrative flair and fun, um, even if it makes me a little bit of a liability. Uh, because I'm I'm just not doing. Oh crap! I you know uh, I'm a rogue who's an arcane trickster, but man, I really like my charisma. Uh, yeah. And I have to have intellect. That's right. silly. Uh, and then, then my, you're getting yeah. deeper into the homebrew side. It's like, okay, yeah, yeah. Your game master could say, yeah, you can use charisma for your spell casting yeah. on your arcane trickster. Whoop de do. But like, that's when I go. One, you're kind of game designing now, and yeah. you're getting away from the core of the rule set, and you've identified potentially a inflexibility, also known as a problem. Um, in the system for supporting the game you want to be playing. And so I think that 5e, because it it feels like a... It, you, you get so many different people approaching this game different ways. And because it feels like a shared touchstone, people come to those tables expecting it to be the same experience that they want. Whether it's like, I want to mimic Critical Role narratively, or they're like, I want to do an old school dungeon crawl and power game or they're like i'm just here to build craft and multi-class out the wazoo you know like all of these different people yeah. are coming to the same table and that's fine but it can cause a lot of problems in yeah. of the expectation of what this game is supposed to be and how it actually plays out and yes that's that goes back to the session zero kind of a conversation but it also goes back to like again if you're getting these people together there may be another game that facilitates the type of play that everybody wants to participate in anyway. And if I were to narrow that 5e person down, I'd say you got to consider build craft as a, a, at least how are we going to handle this? You know, if, because then it like, I've seen dungeon masters that are like, I have a list of all these min max builds that you're not allowed to use because it breaks my game. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. it's like, well, that's dumb too, because if we're not allowing for people to be creative with their build and do something that seems kind of exploitative of the system, then what are the rules reflective of if, if not the world that we're in and the, the commonality that we're sharing when we're participating in this game? Absolutely. And yeah. Yeah. It's no, I, and it's, it is something because like, I don't want to police my players. Yeah. Um, I will I will do what I can to still make things challenging. I don't want to take away their accomplishments or anything like that. Um, but a lot of it comes like, you know, should you play Dungeons and Dragons? Should you play other games? It really comes down to how you want to play. Um, Alice brought this up, uh, Whimsic Academy, uh, where it was, you know, the question was asked, um, you know, short campaign, long campaign, one shot. Yeah. Uh, what do you prefer? And it's funny because, like, all of our mutuals, all our friends, we're just very divided on this topic. Like, like even you and I are pretty divided on this topic because I'm I'm a long haul, yeah. like, deep... I love that stuff. Yeah. And, you know, I do enjoy picking up a game of Mothership. And playing it. I would love mm -hmm. to play a campaign of it. I think that would be super great. Um, I enjoy a long campaign of Cypher. Um, these smaller systems that are more built for like under 10 sessions. I, I do mm -hmm. enjoy that. But I always kind of consider those to be a bit of a mental reset or like a palate yeah. cleanser. For me to jump back into my cipher system, my sure. Dungeons and Dragons, my Pathfinder, uh, it just—I uh, don't know, you know. But that's not everyone else's experience, right? Um, and I think we kind of talked about it, where you know, for some people, it's just maybe they haven't had a good experience yet, and yeah. so like it's it's, uh, and I, I can definitely we have see a lot that, of friends who like, just don't play the big campaigns yeah. of pathfinder or 5e and stuff one because it sounds uninteresting to them or two they had a bad experience with it or three they feel morally they can't play systems made, or yeah. made by corporations like those are all valid things like you play the games valid. you want to play yeah. like, we're not here to actually tell you what to play we are i am gonna advocate for you trying new stuff because we believe that it's worthy of support um but, it's going to make know, you a better gamer. It's going to make you a better game master. It's yeah. going to make you a better storyteller. 
if you are trying and and experiencing these other forms of long and short form storytelling uh collaboratively well so let's uh, kind of wrap on that that point right like i think the the long versus short right and then the different systems therein and stuff if you try out if you're if you're a long haul only kind of person and you start playing some one shots and trying out different systems yeah. that are all like tops three sessions right you're going to learn a couple things one how to get more narrative fulfillment into your D D games or your pathfinder games you're yeah. going to learn that you're going to learn oh my gosh i can do so much more narratively i can abbreviate so many more things we don't need to crawl step by step perceptioning every single room we walk into to get what we want out of it we can move quicker and yeah. still use 5e right like you can do that you will learn how to do that better because you're facilitating more narrative uh conclusion in a shorter amount of time i'd i'd say the same thing goes for how long your sessions go i used to be like four hours minimum ideally six that sounds absolutely insane to me now um oh, that's just I, not I how i no way that's not how i run stuff anymore as i've learn to abbreviate and tell more narrative centric stuff whereas before it's like i would like to go to the bazaar rather than saying you're at the bazaar i'd say okay you begin walking down the street and you see this a good yeah. perception check do you see anything else mm, interesting like i was going all the way to the bazaar there was so many opportunities yeah. for problems and roles didn't need to do yep. that then they get to the bazaar then i'm putting limitations on them even finding what they want we've wasted an hour and they still haven't gotten what they want from the bazaar if all they wanted was twine, right? Like that's dumb. Yeah. And I yep. learned how to not do that. Um, yeah. So if you're trying out these other shorter games, you're going to learn how to employ that better in your, your D&D. Um, conversely, Absolutely. if you're only ever playing Cyber Plus Punk or, you know, um, a, a pickup game of Blades in the Dark or, you know, solo games and stuff like that, you're going to, I think, miss out on yeah. long term earned character growth like if your yeah. priority is narrative you're just doing the same kind of stuff just abbreviated in a lot of ways no you're yeah. not going to have to do the the wall the walk to the bazaar necessarily but in terms of your character arc that you think you can get more a more fulfilling version of in a shorter game you'll be able to feel like you earned it more i think when you have played it over and over and had opportunities to fail and 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 succeed and make progress on those goals and and discover what the arc of that character is as opposed to have it planned out and needing to get that whole thing resolved in a short amount of time. Yep. I think you should try at least one one to two year long campaign in your life. Yes, please. Really get that experience, um, especially if you can do it in person. I know it's really hard these days to do things in person um but uh if if you're if you're capable if not hire me i'll i'll, I'll run you through it uh <laughs> yeah but great. uh with all of the small systems you know they offer tools that um long form systems don't typically offer you by way of really sharpening i i would say your creativity surrounding narrative gameplay um so yeah, I, my closing thoughts on this are have an open mind, uh, try to support third party more often, and, uh, you know, try as many games as you can. You know, you might always come back to Dungeons & Dragons, uh, but when you come back, you're going to bring something good with you. Uh, I'm going to pivot here. Um, there are, it's convention season. Yeah. Uh, conventions are coming up um, at this point point in time like most people we are still planning on doing the gen con run yeah um we're not really going to make a whole bunch of content while we are there uh or well we will it just won't be focused on gen con it is going to yeah, be focused and financially on our goal is to pump money only into yeah. the same kind of stuff we've been talking about with this yeah. whole system conversation like we're going to be supporting independent creators that are there that are already deeply invested in this as an opportunity for their business to get exposure and to grow. Yep. Um, and then we're going to go kind hang of out with everybody else. Yeah, this was an yeah. opportunity for us to go somewhere central and network. You know, there's I we talked a bit about some online stuff and meetups and conventions that we could run online in the future. 
we still want to do that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and we want to make spaces uh, accessible for everybody. And mm -hmm. and this this con season coming up is an opportunity for us to connect with you, connect with different um, creators, and you know learn and grow in our own ways as professionals, quote unquote, in this space. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're excited to go to Indianapolis. We're yes. maybe less excited to go to Gen Con. Exactly. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, we'll probably have an episode at some point in the fairly near future talking about our virtual, com you know, convention dreams. Right. Uh, and the things that we want to do. Uh, we'll probably have some video aspects to that as well, where we just kind of walk things through, cut it down mm -hmm. for podcast, whatever. Right. Um, but in the meantime, uh, November and late August. So end of August is Grand Con in Grand Rapids. Uh, I'm going Michigan. to be there. Uh, so I'm going to be handing out cards and, uh, you know, playing indie games and just having a great time. Uh, and then in Ann Arbor uh, in November is uh, Yukon, uh, which is small, uh, which is not a problem, right? We went to Chaosium Con. Uh, it's in the same place. Uh, so basically more of that. And then I really, I, I haven't bought a ticket to PAX Unplugged yet, but I really would like to go to PAX right. Unplugged. And it's looking more and more likely that I am going to get to do that. Um I, it's uh, uh, essentially my wife is uh, she's she's a, works at a car sales uh, like a dealership and the place she's working at is going to be giving her a demo to drive around. Ooh. Meaning, I will have my truck uh, and I will be able to drive down there, yeah. uh, which will be great. Um, so yeah, uh, we're definitely gonna do our best to hit up the con circuit as much as possible in an unofficial capacity this year. We'll see how things go and what we do next year. Yeah, I mean, uh, as, as we grow, official. yeah, as we grow, we'd love to have a panel. We'd love to yeah. have, you know, an opportunity to have a booth for DJing my books to be able to be available for you to come check out, thumb through, maybe pick up a copy. You know, our sales are probably all going to be through our Kickstarter and then, um, you know, a lot of digital PDFs in the future. But, you know, like that's stuff that we still want to go do. Yeah. We'd love to bring books, sign them, show them off. Um, huge priority for me, especially, you know, that's some, that's a space that I want to grow into professionally and, and hopefully build out as my main thing, um, in the future. So if you're going to any cons coming up here, especially if they are in the Michigan area, please let us know. We'd love to yeah. know about them because we're still learning about the circuit, uh, as a whole and, uh, the different opportunities of where to connect with people. So let us know where yeah. you're going. If you're going to be seeing us there, um, or, or anything like that, uh, we want to hear from you and connect with you. Um, anything else, Deej, or are we good? Yeah. Uh, so in the near future, um, I want to start kind of like shouting out uh, some reviews that we yeah. received. Uh, so if you're listening, please leave us a review. Uh, I don't care what the stars are, but leave some, uh, leave like an actual, like, you know, text give review. Give us feedback. I would, like, we want to know. Give us feedback. We would love that. Uh, and eventually, uh, once we have like the Patreon just, you know, bumping. Uh, I would like to shout out Patreon yeah. members uh, because you all, uh, you the listeners, are amazing, and you are the reason why we are doing this. Um, so please uh, check out our Patreon, uh, leave a review for the podcast, and uh, check out our merch store. You can find all of this stuff at OneShotsTavern.com. Uh, and until next time, uh, this has been One Shots Tavern. Mm -hmm.